All right, welcome to endometriosis. It's not exciting. I don't know why I said it like that. So endometriosis is our topic for today. And we are going to be sliding through it here. So endometriosis, what is it? What to look for? What can we do about it? And uh, there's a lot of guessing that you're going to see today. And um, I hope it's as frustrating for you as it is for those of us with endometriosis. <laughs> So endo is tissue similar to the endometrium lining located outside the uterus. And we are not, it's not identical to the endometrium lining. It's similar. That's probably the only thing, but I think pretty much everyone knows it's outside the uterus. It causes havoc. What is it? Tissue, it's travel, uh, or sorry, the tissue can travel uh, it can move around the body and it will go to areas around the ovaries, bladder, intestines, bowel, and appendix first because those are the closest areas to the uterus. That said, it can travel and you don't necessarily have to have a uterus to have endometriosis, which is a weird thing in and of itself and a super rarity to be sure, but it is a thing. So, um, it is a rarity, but yeah, it can, it's usually in that area and usually the symptoms around it will feel like um, <clears throat> pain ovulating, uh, bladder peeing, burning, uh, intestines usually feels like camp cramping, uh, bad gas, bowels, uh, bad, just bowel movements. It can be uh, a lot, a lot of times it gets me this diagnosis as IBS and for all of those reasons, right? And uh, appendix ruptures, another mis common, common misdiagnosis. Uh, and that's because those are where it tends to be the most. That said, it can travel all over the body and it does. And it, and it goes to joints, it, it can go everywhere and it can go into the lungs. There's a whole thing about it in lungs. So, yay. Uh, it can be felt from the first period and can continue through menopause. So um, you'll probably hear if you have clients with endometriosis that their doctors talk about it in very strange ways. Like uh, I had a doctor who told me that you couldn't have it from the beginning. So because I was in pain from pretty much right out of the gate with my period, it couldn't be endo because that took years to develop. I was on an endometriosis panel with a woman who her doctor said the opposite because her pain came in later, it couldn't be endometriosis because that starts the very first period. So two different doctors, two very different reasons and rationales. So, and, and two misdiagnosis. So it, it can be felt and it can come up at any point. The common symptoms for endometriosis, painful cramping. And that's the initial symptom that most people talk about. And that's the one that people talk about the most because it's, horrifying and it's bad. And it's, um, we'll talk about this down the road too, but it's one of the most painful conditions known to man. So it's painful. Uh, the, some of the reasons, or at least why they think is because that bleeding from the cells outside of the uterus. So that's similar to the endometrium lining that is outside. We'll just call it endocells outside of the uterus are also going to bleed for lack of a better word, when you're menstruating. And this causes inflammation in the area, in the, wherever it is. So around the intestine, around the bladder, around wherever. Uh, and it's gonna cause pain and inflammation in that organ. The blood is going to touch the other organs inside the abdomen, which is going to cause pain because that's not, that's not how they're supposed to function. You know, you're not supposed to be having internal bleeding. Uh, so that causes pain and scar tissue will often develop from the endometriosis and contribute to the pain. So the scar tissue will pull or pinch or whatever. So the scar tissue. So there's three glorious ways he, just here with which uh, those, why those cramps are so bad. They're terrible. And if somebody says I have painful cramps and they legit mean painful cramps and they, you know, oh no, I, and and ibuprofen is not going to do it or whatever, and the leave or whatever it is, it's just not going to cut it. That's a clear sign that you need to go down the endometriosis Q&A list with that person. 
Nausea and vomiting can be one of the symptoms. Again, this these don't affect everybody. And um, I do definitely know women with endometriosis that don't have nausea and vomiting, but I do know a lot that do. So it is very common. It feels very much like food poisoning. Um, there's no stopping it. There's nothing you can do. It can go on for days. It, it goes along with severe diarrhea. It can completely empty you and it will continue well past empty. So it's violent and it's tough on the body and you go through all of that trauma and malnutrition and uh, effort and exhaustion and um, dehydration and there's not much you can do about it but live through it until you come out the other side which unfortunately can be a long time because endometriosis also can cause long and heavy periods and or heavy periods so it can be a lot of bleeding that's um definitely one to ask you know how is your period if it's extra long or if it's extra heavy that's definitely a confirmation check mark Diarrhea, constipation, painful bowel movements. Again, the endometrial tissue, uh, endo cells being on the outside of those organs causing all kinds of issues. Uh, depending on the person, it can swing through all three. It, you know, you can be severely constipated and then have horrifying diarrhea. It, it can swing through them. Uh, it can be one for that person, but you're, you're looking for that kind of reaction, extreme reaction there. Fatigue, it's exhausting. And one of the theories is that it's got an autoimmune issue part, as part of it. So um, what, the fatigue is likely caused by your, uh, your immune system working like crazy, very much like when you get a vaccine and then you feel tired for the next day, which not everybody does, but some people do. And again, here we are. So it's, Theori theoretically, that, fa that fatigue comes from the overactive uh, immune system trying to deal with all of this external bleeding or internal, external uterus bleeding. And it's just exhausting. And I can attest to that because it's the one, um, the one symptom that I still have and that I don't think will ever go away. I think just laying there and letting my body fight and do what it has to do is about all I can do. And it's like when I tell pregnant women, like you're growing a baby, you're busy right now. <laughs> I say that about the endo. I'm like, I, I'm sorry, I'm fighting endometriosis right now. I'm busy, leave a message after the beep. Like there's just something I can do about it. Painful sex. Very classic symptom, one that I am very grateful that I don't have, <laughs> but it is a very common symptom. And sometimes it's the only symptom. I certainly know women who had no other symptoms except for they were having painful sex and that took, you know, took them to the doctor and they did some pelvic work and pelvic exams and then had went in for surgery and went, oh, you've got a bunch of endo around the vaginal canal, usually is why cervix. Um, and it's causing painful sex. It can cause inflammation around the vaginal canal, the cervix, all that area, the Douglas pouch, like all that, all that area. So of course it can lead to painful sex. Uh, infertility, it can plug up the fallopian tubes. It can choke off the ovaries. It can do all kinds of stuff to cause infertility. And uh, endometriosis generally has a 50% fertility or infertility rate. So it's again, a lot of a lot of women find out they have endometriosis because they're having problems with fertility, and they go in to deal with their infertility, and then they find out that they have endometriosis, and they may have other symptoms, but they just thought that was part of being a woman, which is horrifying. Back pain and shooting down the legs pain, and this again, the inflammation going to the back, uh, and I think by now you get it, but back cramps. That's a thing, and that's part of that can be part of endometriosis. The shooting down the legs, getting into the joints, getting around the nerves. That's also common enough that you can ask about it, and it may, you know, help you. Di well, not that you're diagnosing. I don't want to misuse that term, but it may help you diagnose a client. So why does this all happen? And it's. We don't know, we've got a lot of guesses. And 
some of the some of them are perhaps it's a uh, hormonal imbalance that helps contribute to it. Uh, perhaps it's when our estrogen is too high, and we'll I mean we'll talk about all this later. But there's a lot of guesses as to why. Um, so far, we do know that first degree relatives of affected women are five to seven more times more likely to have surgically confirmed endometriosis. So that would be like me, my mother, my aunt, both have endome had endometriosis. They're well past menopausal, but um, they both had endometriosis and they both had pretty bad periods, but they had got, you know, they both got pregnant around, I think 18, you know, they were first generation Polish Catholic, they went to school, they got married. That's what you did. So, um, but they in the pre the pregnancies can sometimes alleviate the painful symptoms. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, so genetics can definitely play a part in it. Travel and implant. So it can move through the body via blood or lymphatic channels, similar to the way cancer spreads. So, um. You know, a lot of the ideas on how to stay healthy for cancer are certainly worth looking into for endometriosis because there's a lot of overlapping between the two. Uh, this is not the only uh, overlap uh, traveling, and uh, it's certainly worth looking into. But that's another, another one. Transform cells in any location may turn into endometrial cells. Isn't that just a fun magic trick that the body can do? But very much like stem cells in our menstrual blood, I can see that overlap. They can turn into anything. Uh, direct transplantation. So surgery contamination. And this has happened where someone would go in for a C-section and then end up with endometriosis and it showed up in the uh, C-section scar tissue. Uh, I definitely have seen that. Retrograde menstruation. So this is common. A lot of women have retrograde menstruation where as you are menstruating, it goes up the fallopian tubes as well as out the vaginal canal. Uh, apparently that's very common and it happens a lot, but for some reason, women with endometriosis and the theory is that perhaps is that immune system issue that that actually is why that retrograde menstruation turns into uh, endometriosis and causes all the havoc that it causes. Faulty immune system. So it could be as simple as the immune system not behaving properly and causing all of this. And likely it's a combination of all of these things, right? I, I mean, most, most illness is a combination of effects and a combination of solutions. And this is no different. Uh, high estrogen. So uh, estrogen exacerbates uh, the growth of the tissue, the endo cells. Progesterone uh, slows the growth of endo tissue. So take from that what you will, but one of the reasons that I think using the central system has been so effective for myself and other women that I've worked with endometriosis is because it helps to balance those hormones and it helps to reduce your estrogen while increasing your progesterone. And my suspicion is that that helps slow the growth. I don't know that it could reverse it, but slow it, which would bring some relief, you know, if it's getting worse every month and it's not getting worse anymore, that's in and of itself relieving. So, um, I know that it takes more than just that focus, but usually if you're doing that, you're also helping boost the immune system. You know, if you're eating in flow, you're helping them boost the immune system. If you're experimenting with things, you're probably eliminating some things which can help boost the immune system. And so there is definitely looking into autoimmune protocols involved as well as hormone balancing involved. It really needs to be both of those things, at least in my experience working with people, um, you have to have both. So known risk factors, uh, 
again, these aren't necessary, but we do know them. There are there are studies that show this. So menarche, but beginning at uh, younger than 11 years of age, and heavy prolonged menses. Those are our two knowns. Not terribly helpful in the grand scheme of things, but <laughs> yeah. We misdiagnose it a lot. So um, if you have a client who's showing all the signs of endometriosis, ask them, have you been diagnosed with any of these? Because these are all, now I'm not saying that they might not have them both, right? You can have IBS and endometriosis at the same time. That's not, they're not mutually exclusive. You can have an appendicitis and have endometriosis. Though if you have painful endometriosis, you might not notice your appendicitis and that happens and women die every year from that. So it's possible that you can have two of these things at the same time. Yes. So, you know, but if somebody has been diagnosed with some of these disorders, and I know mental health is just really vague, but if you've been, what's the name? <laughs> women tend to get diagnosed with mental health issues a lot and they're, they're not correct. Um, they're, they're a cop out because we don't care really, frankly, about men, women's health. So there's usually a lot of mental health diagnosis that goes along with it that's not right. Um, so anyway, if any of these come up in your health histories or if you are asking, you're going down the rabbit hole because you think one of your clients has endometriosis, these are also things that you wanna ask them. You know, Have you been diagnosed with anything? You may want to show them this list. You may want to just ask them. And if one of these comes up, you can go from there. 75.2% uh, of patients reported being misdiagnosed with another physical health problem and or mental health problem. So 75% were misdiagnosed with a different issue. 53% uh, by gynecologists and 34% by general practitioners, which Specialization is not always the best. You know, maybe the specialization is to go to an endometriosis place itself. Uh, I know Canada has one. Um, and, and get that specialization right out of the gate. Um, but yeah, that's just the stats. And I thought that they were interesting and worth sharing with you guys. Uh, so those misdiagnoses come from a lot of different places. Um, it can take eight to 11 years for a diagnosis, kind of depends on your country and your healthcare system. Higher odds of reporting a mental health misdiagnosis was exclusively associated with reports of a younger symptom onset age, right? So I certainly had a counselor in college go, I think you might be bipolar. Um, or I had endometriosis and no one cared, but here you are. I, if you've got younger, or if you have a client who's not younger, but they say, you know, I did have a, a mental health diagnosis, you may want to ask them when that happened. Did they have these symptoms at the same time? Because there is a higher odds of that misdiagnosis, and it could help you find out, you know, and again, it may be a correct diagnosis, but it doesn't mean that the endometriosis, endometriosis doesn't exist. And then last uh, on this section anyway, the stages of diagnosis do not equal lived experience and they're in the process of reevaluating the stages. So as of now, it's, it's diagnosed by stage based on points. And so when the doctors are doing the surgery, because the only way to diagnose is through surgery, is by this is what they see in assigning points to it. And you can have stage one and be in horrifying pain and you can be in stage four and have no symptoms at all. So this is why I think that there's more to it. You know, there, that autoimmune issue that goes in, in connection with it, um, especially when there's things like pain or other symptoms, I wonder if that's part of it. Again, I don't know, but I wonder if that's part of it. So I'm going to try not to get too side tangenty by my own theories on all of this. But um, yeah, so the diagnoses is not necessarily corresponding to their symptoms. So if they come to you and they say, you know, I have stage four, that might just, it doesn't necessarily mean that's their lived experience. You still want to follow up and ask them questions. So where do we start? Notice the symptoms, you know, pain, viral symptoms, like those flu-like nausea, diarrhea, constipation, uh, 
cold sweats. I had cold sweats. Uh, so any of those kind of viral symptoms, heavy, long periods, painful sex, fatigue, infertility, these are really the biggest of them. Uh, but again, you can go back to that um, symptoms page, follow up, ask them about all of the other symptoms, ask them about misdiagnoses, ask them about their history, ask them if they've had any testing done, um, you know, what have they, what's been ruled out, what, or, you know, what have they, because again, you know, if somebody says, well, I was diagnosed with IBS and I have all these other symptoms, you may, it may be worth going, okay, well, that to me sounds like IBS and endometriosis. Does it matter if it's one or both? At the end of the day, they're going to need to go talk to their doctor because the only way that you can confirm it is through the surgery. So they're going to have to go talk to their doctor anyway. What it's not. So it's cyclical endometriosis. So if you're looking at things and you're seeing it in cyclical patterns, that's a really good guess that you've got an endo situation going on. Um, that said, you can have pain throughout the cycle, uh, throughout the whole cycle. So it, you kind of need to have a discerning eye in there. But if you're seeing things happen and you know they're having those IBS symptoms all month long, it's not likely endometriosis that's causing those problems. Again, they could have IBS and endo, right? So that's not out of the ordinary. But if they're having those IBS symptoms and it's only happening two weeks out of the month, it's more likely associated with their cycle and potentially endometriosis than not. So you want to dig in and make sure that there is a cyclical element to it or look at, look at the whole thing. So testing, there's only one form, it's endoscopic surgery. That's the only option. Someday we'll have another option, hopefully, but for now, that's it. How you can help. So if you have a client that you suspect has endometriosis, regardless of whether they go have the surgery confirmation or not, you can get started with them. And the first thing you need to do is address gut health. Uh, it's usually not good in most people. So it's kind of a blanket statement when we say start with gut health. And I would say with any period problem, you're gonna start with gut health. Endometriosis is no different from that in this case, but you're gonna start with gut health. It's gonna be the, um, the foundation, so to speak, of where you wanna go. Um, and I often, and this is where kind of the autoimmune protocol thing comes in for me is a lot of times I, well, with my endometriosis clients, I really want to start with that autoimmune protocol and that's that gut health, gut healing. So a lot of times I did this and it worked with clients as well is starting with a GAPS diet or an AIP or something that's really an elimination diet where it's just like, good sweet potatoes, brassicas, protein, uh, bone broth, and um, sauerkraut, Pro the juice. You start with the juice uh, just to get the probacteria going. So it's a really simplistic uh, meal, but if you start that elimination diet, you'll likely see a difference in their next cycle. I mean, it's the 30 days of at least being gluten-free and sugar-free and caffeine-free and all that stuff. And you don't necessarily have to stick to just those like five foods of the GAPS diet, but um, it does help to establish and they can start eating more quickly, um, but just stay away from some of those big triggers, which are down the slide a little bit further. And that can help it, do it for 30 days and I can help show you in the next cycle. Trigger foods. So again, it's got, it's, it just has such an autoimmune reaction when I work with clients that it's so overlapping where it's like, let's find your trigger food. And we've got gluten, soy, dairy. Uh, those are huge ones. And especially gluten and dairy, those are really period problems, those are the, kind of your two go-tos to start with. So, uh, you know, 
some clients are in, some clients need more time. You're going to have to work with that with them to see how it goes. You know, some are ripped the bandaid off. Let's just do this. Some are like, uh, I might be able to like do one of those. <laughs> just, you, you know, start where they are, but see if you can figure out what that trigger food is, because it seems like everyone I've worked with has had one. Flow freedom. Estrogen linked that increase in growth and spread. So use the flow freedom tools, use those hormonal balancing lifestyle activities with them. Again, it reduces the estrogen. It can help reduce the growth and the spread. PTSD, women with endometriosis have a lot of PTSD symptoms. I'm not gonna diagnose, but I am gonna say, I feel like I have PTSD and I have a tapping coach for it. Uh, I would recommend that anybody who has this kind of history, especially if they have pain, fertility struggles, I, you know, IBS symptoms, if they're having an extreme, it's happening every single month and there's no avoiding it and you can't get out of it. You know, you're going to be shot every single month. You know that you're going to be in horrifying pain for days every single month. You know, you're going to pu puke your brains out every single month for three days straight until you're sobbing on the floor and it wears on you. And I personal experience, it wears on you and you can't avoid it and you can't get around it. And there's no way to stop it. And you end up in this anxious horror show and PTSD. So if you have a client that has painful symptoms or, um, any of those kinds of things, encourage them to do some kind of work with somebody that can help reduce those PTSD symptoms. You don't even have to say PTSD, honestly, just here's, you know, I, you, you've gone through a lot of hard work. It's been a really traumatic experience. I really recommend you work with a counselor or a tapping expert for trauma or something like that. You know, you don't have to say PTSD, but I promise you they're going to feel a lot more heard uh, when they get it. So, okay. Caffeine and alcohol. There are studies that back up that caffeine and alcohol are just worse for women with endometri or menstruators with endometriosis. It's just, it's bad for us. So um, I don't do either. I have a couple sips of my boyfriend's wine from time to time if it's excellent. But it just, it's just, you got, you got to help them get through it and get rid of them. Um, sugar, gluten, and dairy, again, we talked about those as trigger foods. It, those are not not necessarily end-all be-alls. Um, I can have some dairy without it being a huge problem. I cannot have any gluten. I also know people with endometriosis that can have gluten, but no dairy. So it, it, like I said, it's usually one of those two and also sugar exacerbates it. So you want to make sure that they're bringing the sugar in. And then probiotics. So there was a study done on, uh, on gut, the gut makeup of those with endometriosis. And it turned out that there's a different biome in those with endometriosis. And there's a bit of chicken or the egg on that, but there's definitely a difference. And what that means, no one knows. <laughs> There's no like, oh, well, that means just make sure you get your probiotics and it'll be fine. Uh, who knows? So I'm gonna just put this here. We're gonna talk about cannabis a little bit. And if it's illegal where you are, obviously I'm not advocating for you to break the law, but it's rapidly being legalized around the world and it has research. Like not a lot of men's, there's not a lot of endometriosis research out there. So I'm not going to turn away research. And fortunately for me, the cannabis community focuses on pain. It's one of the things that they, that's one of their like calling cards is pain, pain, cancer, children, seizures. So there's, there is some research and I am, I am going to take it. So here's one of the things about CBD oil. Uh, it, you can read it. It was one of the most effective self-care techniques for endometriosis pain. So if 
a, a lot of places to have access to CBD oil that may not have access to full THC inclusive. And we're talking about THC and why that is actually important for endometriosis, but even CBD could be helpful. I personally have a CBD uh, heavy THC blend and I take that oil when I'm in my endo and it, as the flare up, the more I take and it reduces and I generally feel a little bit better. Um, oftentimes you realize CBDs are working when you stop taking them and the pain comes back <laughs> or increases. So uh, I have, a, like I said, I have a heavy CBD oil that I take with a little bit of THC in it. So it's not very fun in that <laughs> trippy way, um, but it has that little bit of THC and you're going to see why I believe it's important. And I'll tell you as a Californian who's <laughs> smoked pot for 10 years, um, I like the CBD in there and I personally have less pain and less anxiety and less PTSD like symptoms when I have a bit of both in that combination. So just the CBD, which I've tried, isn't nearly as effective. And I have tried a lot of different things. I lived in the Mecca of, of medical marijuana for like 10 years and friends that grew it. They helped me. They brought me CBD plants. That was fantastic. We used to make CBD kombucha. Another thing is that we've got a lot of history behind us on this. Chinese texts described its usefulness for relieving of pain and cramps and ancient India as well. So you can look those up, but these were recorded 3,000 years ago. So, you know, it's been used in different cultures in the world to relieve pain and anxiety, and those are definitely big problems with endometriosis. And here's the bit about the THC. So the endocannabinoid system, when it's working properly, helps, uh, gosh, I'm gonna butcher this, ap apostis. I used to know how to say that. Anyway, um, natural cell death. So your cells are supposed to die. And this is one of the problems with cancer, right? The cancer cells are supposed to die, but they don't. <laughs> and figuring out why, one of the reasons that they've been studying it is because they seem to, to slow tumor growth. It seems to slow endometriosis growth when the endocannabinoid system is stimulated. And that's that CB1 and CB2. Those are stimulated by THC and it seemed to decrease the growth. So there's two studies below here because the THC is the second study, but the THC in mice reduced the pain and limited the development of endometrial cysts. So that's also on the, you know, so we've got some studies that show the endocannabinoid system not working properly in endometriosis growth as well as cancer growth and that stimulating those uh, receptors seem to decrease growth and we've seen it work in mice and this is why I think that the mixture of that THC CBD can really help because that stimulates the endocannabinoid system and brings it into more balance is how it was described to me um, which makes sense I, I'm sure they were trying to explain it like a period <laughs> hormonal imbalance person but it's how it works so that's my little soapbox there. So endometriosis, according to the NHS, is, the is one of the most painful diseases. They did the top 20 painful uh, diseases known to man and endometriosis was listed on there as well as other things that I'm gonna tell you I have or have had like frozen shoulder. Frozen shoulder is a walk in the park compared to my cramps. And this is why people die from heart attacks and appendix ruptures and sepsis because it doesn't hurt as much as their cramps. So it, it's painful. Um, it, there's not a lot known about endometriosis. So it's, it's tough to diagnose, it's tough to understand, it's tough to help, it's tough to cure. There is no cure. Uh, we have to advocate for it. Uh, there's no way that any of this is gonna change if we don't advocate. And um, that can be as simple as just sharing information and knowledge out there in the world. Uh, every March is Endometriosis Awareness Month, and you're always welcome to come share everything I post about it anytime, frankly, but I go to my March section of my Instagram and there's gonna be a lot there. <laughs> uh, and then we can relieve the symptoms 
that's really the best we can do and put it into a state of remission. And uh, if I so much as venture down the wrong path slightly, my period is horrifying the next month. So I stick to a very strict regimen because it feels better. It doesn't hurt. Um, so remission is about the best that we can look for. And that just means reduction of symptoms. And that, that's where we're at. Um, we, we, I've not met anyone that was able to completely eliminate them, but uh, maybe possible one day. You can regain a quality of life this way though. You know, if you can get relief, encourage it. If your clients are um, looking at getting surgery to have the tissue removed, let them do it. It's gonna feel better and they're gonna be much more able to focus on doing an extreme diet or getting rid of something crazy, you know, getting rid of gluten for 30 days or whatever it is. They're going to be just much more uh, coherent and capable of trying those things if they've got some relief. So if they're going to get surgery, that's fine. You know, whatever their doctors suggest on that front, let them do it. You know, I have had people who said, I'm not going to do the surgery. I'm going to just try and, and reduce it. And that's fine. It's their choice. At the end of the day, they have to make the choice that they want to make, but don't discourage them because it brings relief and it's going to grow back. So they're going to have to do something. But sometimes just that window of relief is all the difference. And I have also seen them get the window of relief, go back to their bad habits. And then the symptoms start to come back and they very quickly go, oh shit. And, and get them to get it together like that month. So it can be helpful. Um, the adding in the diet and the lifestyle, do the flow freedom stuff with them. Cannabis, if it's available to you, again, it can help reduce the pain. It can help reduce the growth. Um, don't let them use it as a band-aid though. It can't be the only thing you do. It, you have to do, you know, all of the change the lifestyle, stop overworking and burnout, stop stressing yourself like crazy, stop being a perfectionist overachiever, stop eating the crap, um, and use that as a tool to help. But it's not going to be able to band aid over all the, of the, the other things that need to be done. Uh, look for triggers. We're not talking about just food triggers. Look for through their lifestyle, their work, their relationships, and reduce and eliminate, remove whatever you have to do. Uh, I can tell you from my own experience, it's not just food. I can't work like an insane person in Loodle and I can't do very much in deep Loodle or I will be back on the floor. Um, it's just how it is. So look at their lifestyle. Are, you know, are they doing crazy boot camp classes in deep Loodle? Cause that's, and I mean, unless they say that it helps cause it does help for some encourage them to try not doing it for a month or for that phase and see if that helps. Um, it's an experiment, you know, if it doesn't work, if there's no difference, go back to doing it next month. Fine. But look at those things, look at the relationships, see if they've got support, see if they're floundering, look at those bigger triggers, because if they're trying to do all of the things, which endometriosis people tend to be overworkers, um, just do it themselves -ers, you have to look at all of those things. So look at the big picture with them and then work through to get rid of it. So in conclusion, there is hope. I don't want anyone to walk away thinking that there's just nothing that can be done. There is absolutely reduction at the very least as a possibility and every little bit helps. Make noise, get out there, be loud, advocate, talk to people, share, post about it, whatever. Promote, uh, promote research. If you see research come up, promote it, put it out there into the world. Uh, and, and if you can, if you know anybody, if you've got anyone out there who you might be able to influence into getting some research done, go advocate, <laughs> be honest and be hopeful. So when you're approaching your clients and this is something that comes up for them, be honest and tell them exactly what it is. They're going to be able to take it. If, especially if they have any of those dramatic symptoms, they can handle truth but also be hopeful because there, there is hope. So be honest, but be hopeful with them.